I would like to uh, uh, first congratulate Sahasra ENT Foundation for organizing such an excellent ENT webinar series for the benefit of our ENT colleagues in the fraternity. Secondly, I would like to uh, thank the audience who have uh, spared their time uh, with us to update themselves and share the knowledge with the eminent speakers. Thirdly, and never the least, he is one of the best eminent personalities in the ENT fraternity. He is none other than Dr. Professor Mohan Kameshwaran, sir. Sir doesn't need any introduction. If I have to introduce uh, Dr. Mohan Kameshwaran, sir, it's like introducing uh, Lord uh, Balaji to his devotees. Okay? So, he is a Padma Shri awardee and he has been the first person to operate ABI in South India. So, this was conducted at uh, MERF, uh, that is Madrasi and Research Foundation. Now, I would like to request Dr. Mohan Kameshwaran, sir, to deliver his lecture on auditory brainstem implantation. Sir, um, please go ahead with your lecture, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay Gray. Thank you, and, sir. And uh, I would like to also uh, place on record my sincere thanks to Sri Harsha and the Sarasra ENT Foundation. I, I know that they have been doing wonderful work in this period and uh, you know, it's been an excellent series of uh, talks. Yes, uh, so it's nice to see you all. I can see Professor M.P. Aparo also. So it's um, good to see him and uh, you know, seeing all more friends. So let me uh, you now share the screen with you. Um, okay, can you see the, the picture now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. So, I'm going to today uh, talk to you all about auditory brain stem implantation. Now, it's, not a, it's not a common procedure at all. It's quite a rare uh, surgery. And there are many reasons why it is uh, rare. First of all, the indications are very, very limited. Secondly, it is still an evolving surgery. Uh, and uh, particularly the indications are evolving. And there are very few centers which have been authorized now to do the procedure. But there are hardly about 15 centers world over which are really doing uh, you know, meaningful work or meaningful numbers. So we are collating the results and still trying to uh, evolve uh, regarding the indications. So it's not a common procedure. So, but it's important for uh, the uh, ENT fraternity to know about it because it is one of the cutting edge uh, you know, work which is happening in the specialty. So we need to know something about what's happening, why, and uh, the basis for this work. One of the most fascinating aspects for me of the auditory system is the phenomenon of tonotopicity. In other words, the place which principle. And this is something which is present throughout the auditory system, right from the cochlea all the way to the auditory cortex, both the primary and secondary auditory cortex. So, any part of the auditory system, you will find this phenomenon of tonotopicity. And uh, it, is, it is quite uh, fortuitous for us uh, ENT surgeons because it's the only system in the entire central nervous system which has this organized principle of tonotopicity. If you look at any other system in the brain, it works on a principle of what is known as organized chaos. But there is uh, no organization, but there is a certain principle to it. So there, you know, you can't take advantage of the, such a system. It's much more complex. The auditory system is quite simple in its layout. And it is for this, this reason that we have been able to introduce various uh, interventions in the form of implants, auditory implants, at various levels of the auditory system. By uh, sequential stimulation of the auditory system at different locations, we can restore the sensation of hearing. Now, the entire auditory system can be visualized as a, a series of cascades. As there are several stations in this auditory system. And each system, each station is an opportunity for the surgeon. So if you have an interruption of the auditory uh, system, then it is possible for us, at least theoretically, to go one station above or one station proximal to that point of interruption. And then you can stimulate that area 
because of the donut opacity present, you can give a sensation of hearing and restore a sensation of hearing. So this is a, a great thing, a great opportunity for us. It's only because of that, that cochlear implants have been so successful. In fact, don't forget that of all the, uh, you know, the uh, implants and stimulations available in the brain, including deep brain stimulation and everything, the forerunner was cochlear implantation. And it was only the success of cochlear implantation that every other implant has come into the brain. The entire concept of deep brain stimulation or DBS came only after seeing the success of cochlear implants and the concept that it is possible for us to integrate an external electronic circuit with the complex the auditory system or complex neuronal circuits in the brain. So this uh, very principle was outlined only after the success of cochlear. Now, the auditory brainstem implant, of course, is, a, is an electrode, which is, as its name implies, kept in the brainstem, specifically on the cochlear nucleus. And the cochlear nucleus is, uh, is quite complex. When it is stimulated with electrical impulses, the patient has a perception of sound, a perception of hearing. Now, on the left side here, you, you can see the uh, implant itself, and you can see at the tip of it, you can see it's very much like a cochlear implant, except that it's a plate electrode. And on the right side is a schematic diagram of the intervention. So you have a, a, a schematic diagram at the level of the brainstem, the cerebellum here, and uh, you see specifically the, the lateral bristles here, and a dorsal and a ventral cochlear. And the implant is inserted to varying levels to cover the ventral cochlear nucleus and varying level extent of the dorsal cochlear. Uh, it's, so as I said, it's kept in the lateral bristles, and it is very close to the foramen lusca, and it stimulates the ventral and the very plus amount of the dorsal cochlear. Now, this is very important for us to understand. Now, the if you look at the cochlear nucleus, it can be divided into a dorsal and a ventral cochlear. The ventral cochlear nucleus is further subdivided into an anterior and a posterior ventral cochlear nucleus. Now the the importance is that both high and low frequency fibers are represented very well in the ventral cochlear nucleus. But the high frequency fibers, which are represented in the cochlear nucleus, are very few. The majority of the high frequencies are represented more specifically in the dorsal cochlear nucleus. So the dorsal cochlear nucleus is almost uh, specifically meant for high frequency sound. And the importance is that when you are implanting uh, with an electrode, you know, the, you have here, this is the ventral and the dorsal portion. And the electrode is entering through the foramen lusca into the natural process. You have the dorsal nucleus here, ventral nucleus here. This insertion is literally blind. And you usually like the cochlear implant to stop at the point of first resistance. Now, when the electrode goes in, Unless it is deep enough to cover the dorsal cochlear nucleus, you may not have adequate high frequency information coming. And the high frequency information is very important because most of the consonants in speech are in the high frequency spectrum. So, for us to understand speech with clarity, you need a lot of high frequency information in the uh, person's so that's the reason why the dorsal cochlear nucleus is important and the depth of insertion is quite important and may very much represent the uh, variability in results that we are getting in One of the problems that we are facing and we have been uh, at, uh, trying to overcome in various measures is that at the present moment, we have no accurate measure of actually studying or knowing beforehand the dimension of the lateral process. So therefore, you know, we have an implant which is fairly standard and one size fits all kind of implant. Now that may not be good enough in every case because the lateral process is extremely variable and some patients, you may have a lot of difficulty with insertion and it's quite possible that the dorsal of the nucleus may not be fully represented in the group. That is, may account for the, uh, uh, some, in some patients at least, uh, 
less than optimal outcomes. So there are many variables, and as I said, we are still in the process of learning and evolving. One thing the uh, audit, the ABI or the brains and implant has taught us is how we are thinking of a product system. We are still coming to grips with many aspects of it which we haven't talked about in the past, and we are trying to learn in the process. From each patient is a uh, learning experience for us. So we are all in the process of learning and collating results and seeing why we can how, how we can improve the results. And in particular, again, the result is not good. Why is it not that it is so on? The current indications for auditory based implantation could be either post-lingual or pre-lingual, as we have And post-lingual are pretty well laid out, you know. So the most classical gold standard indication is an MF2. Where you have bilateral uh, vestibular trauma, and uh, in such a situation, when you are operating, it's, uh, it's not often possible to preserve the cochlear nerve. The usual rule is that when you are removing the tumor, the cochlear nerve also gets harmed because of the very close proximity of the cochlear nerve to the vestibular uh, trauma. In fact, in uh, 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 classical vestibular trauma, which is uh, unilateral. Very nowadays, the emphasis is not just on preserving patient now, but also to try and preserve the cochlear nerve. Sometimes you can do it. You, you can you can actually preserve the cochlear nerve and remove the uh, tumor. If that is the case, then if the cochlear nerve which you have preserved is functional, then a cochlear implant can be inserted in these patients and they can restore pain. This is more difficult in an NF2 where the vestibular schwannoma which you see in NF2 is much more adherent to the cochlear nerve. It's very difficult anatomically to preserve the cochlear nerve. So in NF2 patients, invariably, both sides cochlear nerves are reversed. And uh, when there's no cochlear nerve, you cannot uh, have a cochlear implant function. So in these patients, the option is to introduce an NF2, I mean, a vestibular AVI into the patient. Usually, this is done either on the uh, tumor removal. Uh, it can be done on the first side or the second side. A more classical situation is that you remove one side tumor, the patient still has some bearing in the other ear to manage the patient. And when you're removing the second side also, that's the time that an uh, ABI or an implant is inserted. Uh, so, this is the usual situation. But there are a few centers uh, which have, uh, particularly Nottingham, uh, sorry, Manchester, which has uh, experimented with the possibility of what is the speaker implants. It's an interesting concept. What they do is that if they're removing the NF2 on the first side, they put in an, an ABI at the same sitting. Even though the other side tumor is uh, still small and there is healing, they have just kept an ABI in the first side but not activated. And on the second side, when the tumor is removed, at that time, the, the ABI which was kept there was is activated. So this is known as a sleeper implant. Now it has plus and minus points. The plus point being that, you know, because you have kept the implant there already, you don't have to go after the tumor in order to reduce the implant in that city. This is always more difficult. The second, uh, you know, uh, the biggest disadvantage, I would say, is that having an implant on the other side, Precludes to some extent the possibility of a, an MRI for following up the second side. So these are plus and minus points of that. But the vast majority of uh, the surgeons in the world would uh, actually wait for the second side tumor removal to introduce an uh, ABI on the second side. The other situation where you have a uh, possibility that in a postlingual situation you have to use an ABI is when there is a complete white out or complete ossification of the following meningitis and you cannot introduce a cochlear implant. Ideally in a meningitic patient you want to intervene as soon as possible for ossification so that you can introduce a cochlear implant and get the patient in But if there is a delay for whatever reason then uh, it becomes very difficult to then introduce a cochlear implant. One of the uh, solutions, a very good solution, was proposed by Professor Kirtane, uh, and that was to stent the cochlear. So he said if there is a possibility that the patient is not able to, let's say, afford an implant for months, 
then instead of wasting time, you know, what he suggested was that we open up, do a, a stenting with, a, with just a dummy, you know, not the cochlear implant, and leave it. At least you have stented the cochlear. You can go in later whenever the funds are available to the cochlear implant and do this. So, this is the suggestion which we the wonderful suggestion of the run in but uh, if you see a patient, unfortunately, with severe ossification of the cochlea, uh, you try a cochlear implant like uh, insertion. The option is an aim. Similar situation also in far advanced cochlear ossification. So if you have ex extreme, uh, you know, ossification of the cochlea in uh, advanced ossification, then again it becomes very difficult to introduce a cochlear implant. I have a short video to show you uh, how. Manage for advanced osteoporosis, but generally, when you see a patient with advanced osteoporosis, the first effort is to try and put in a cochlear implant. And if you can't do that, then of course you may have to use a median. There's again another situation in far advanced osteoporosis where a cochlear implant may not be useful, and that is if there is severe electrical leakage. So, autosclerotic bone leaks electricity. So a lot of patients will have facial twitching in advanced autosclerosis. So you put in a cochlear implant, you switch it on, and then the patient will start having facial twitching. Generally, this happens in the second turn of the cochlea, which is in very close proximity to the jetty-jet membrane. There, at that point, actually the bone which separates the cochlea from the genital ganglia may be very, very thin. Sometimes as thin as even less than a millimeter, sometimes even 0.2 or 0.3 millimeters. So practically that bone is just leaking electricity and autosclerotic bone tends to be very porous by electricity. So these patients then if you switch on the switch off the, the electrodes which are responsible, you can still salvage the electrode and the patient can find the not useful or not useful. But sometimes the leakage is so severe that most of the electrodes are, are leaking electricity and causing the patient damage. I mean, that situation, a cochlear implant is not useful, and only an ABI may be. The very, very rare situation is a bilateral temporal bone fracture with cochlear nerve emulsion on both sides. This is very rare. I have only seen one patient till now, uh, and that, that patient, of course, didn't have an ABI. Only one situation all this is have I seen a bilateral temporal bone fracture with aversion on both the uh, There's usually a very severe uh, history of that. And this last one is a very controversial indication in my opinion. That's a, a bilateral audit neuropathy. Now, generally, audit neuropathy it can be divided into a peripheral and a proximal. The peripheral type, fortunately, is a much more common. That's where you know you have the classical triad of very poor speech discrimination, uh, completely uh, uh, absent error, normal cochlear uh, microphonics or autoristic function, and uh, absent reflexes also. I mean, those patients you do a cochlear implant, they benefit. But if it's a proximal type, then they, you don't see this type, and you will not be benefiting from a cochlear implant. The only way you can differentiate between a peripheral and a proximal is with a trans tympanic EAPR or a really more moderately made response. Now that will tell you whether it's a proximal behavior response is more in favor of a discriminant. And they will benefit from the cochlear implant. So if you're a proximal type where the cochlear implant will not benefit, there have been some surgeons who have proposed or even done an EAPI. This is a very variable. So I think the evidence is still not very much in favor of. Now, what about the prelingual indications? Today, auditory patient implant is much more successful in pediatric API in prelingual situations. And wherever you cannot have a cognitive implant function in a child with bilateral profound hearing loss, then an ABI would be the solution in that. Now, here are some examples. This is a bilateral NF2. You can see on one side, it's very big, it's very, very low. And the second side is also got a uh, 
Uh, just because of the size of the tumor, you cannot discriminate, uh, you know, you say about the hearing. Sometimes you surprise that the smaller tumor is causing more hearing loss. So, bigger. so basically, we operate on the side with the poorer hearing first, and then take up the side with the better hearing. This is the second situation where there's a complete cochlear nerve epicenter. You can see the very, very stenotic involved in the area and the absent cochlear nerves on both sides. You can also have a situation where you have a rudimentary cochlea. You can just see a bud of a cochlea. Yes, this is a cochlear hyperplasia. In this cochlear part, you can't put it in a cochlear implant. So this is a situation where you cannot do a cochlear implant. Even though there is a rudimentary cochlea and cochlear nerve bilateral. And of course, bilaterally ossified cochlea. Mm -hmm. You see here a close member cochlea. And uh, even though you know it looks as though you might be able to do an MRI, there is absolutely no procedure. There. And it's very difficult to actually get an electrode into this situation. Now, this is a, a, a video of a cochlea, advanced cochlear autosclerosis. I just put it up to show you some principles. Generally, in a situation like this, we try and do a cochlear stick, not a long window insertion. And you have to do a, a fairly big cochleostomy because you want to enter into the basic jar and then work inside the ASO. You can see now the very soft spongiotic bone which is inside the basal jar. You see my hand is not, but you can see that that's a little soft bone. It's very different from the, the very dense bone of the, uh, of the, of the cochlea itself. So you generally pick it up with a, a, a blunt instrument like a pick. Very gently, all the bone is taken out until you see a lumen. And then you try and introduce a, uh, uh, first of all, you want to introduce a, a depth gauge to see whether you can actually get the implant in. And if you can do that, then of course the actual implant pocket implant is introduced. But sometimes you find that you go on dissecting and there is no lumen. And you cannot actually introduce uh, even a dummy inside, even two, one or two electrodes won't go in. Uh, that's a situation where it's a totally ossified cochlea, totally cochlea uh, with total new ossification of the hospital. Then an API is indicated. Interestingly, API in uh, autosclerosis works very well. So, almost all the post nasal indications, the autosclerotic. Uh, a cochlear implant cannot be used. It's one of the best in adults. So they do very well because they already have the knowledge of uh, the sound and sound experience in the brain and they pick it up very well. And they do much better than people with even energy. So, autosclerotic patients in whom cochlear implants cannot be done. I'm emphasizing this first indication is cochlear implant. If you can't do that, then of course an ABI. So, in children, of course, the most classical indication is bilateral initial deformity, where there is a complete absence of cochlea. No cochlea, no cochlear implant. So, it's a simple model. The second is the cochlea may be present, but the cochlear nerve is absent. There's a complete aplasia of the cochlear nerve. Now, here I have to qualify it a bit. So, what do you mean by aplasia? Uh, you can only say a nerve is not present. If there are certain conditions of the first of all, an MRI must be at least three Tesla MRI. You cannot say this in one point by Tesla MRI because the definition is not good enough. So, first of all, ask for three Tesla MRI. In the three Tesla MRI, you are not able to identify the nerve. Even then, it doesn't mean that there is no nerve at all. There are sometimes, you know, two possibilities are there. There are few nerve fibers which you are not picking up. All the nerve fibers of the cochlear nerve are being hitchhiking in some other nerve, like the vestibular nerve. There may be an unbranched cochlear vestibular nerve. So, they're possible. So, in that situation, you would still do a trans tympanic EAPR and ensure that there's no response before you jump in for an EAPR. So, you have to have clear concepts. So, you're defining an absent cochlear nerve based on the fact that in the three Tesla MRI, it is not identifiable. More cochlear nerves identifiable. And then you've done a, a trans tympanic evoke, electrically evoke auditory page response, and you've not been able to identify any responses in that. That's an indication for a place. Similarly, if there's a severely ossified cochlear or a cochlear implant is not possible. 
Now, uh, this is, as I say, we already showed this, where complete apps is the software problem. So now this is the current uh, situation of the application, the European consensus uh, statement, which was put together by uh, a group of us. Uh, even though it's called European consensus like statement, it's actually an international statement. It was almost uh, all the important uh, clinics from the world were doing API, part of this consensus statement. We all put it together. First and foremost, of course, is the very clear indications or the definite indications. Here, you think about the shell APIs, we already talked about it, and cochlear APIs here, cochlear nerve APIs here, and cochlear aperture APIs. What is the cochlear aperture? Cochlear aperture is the base of the modulus when the nerve exits the modulus and enters the internal So, the, this may be sometimes complete. Connecting with the cochlear. Possible indications, and these are still you know evolving indications. Some people would agree with that, some people would not agree with that, but these are probably you know, the majority opinion. So you have a hypoplastic cochlea with cochlear aperture hypoplastia, where the cochlea is so small that you know, meaningful insertion of cochlear is not the second one is a common cavity and an incomplete partition type one if the nerve is not present. So here you have a, a, a dysplastic cochlea, you also have an absent cochlea. The third is a dysplastic cochlea, like a common cavity and incomplete partition type one. If the cochlear nerve is present, but if your nerve is present, you're going to put in a cochlear implant. But sometimes the nerve cochlear implant may not function. And the reason is that the distribution of the neural tissue in a common cavity as well as an incomplete partition type 1 is entirely peripheral, very yeah. unpredictable. And if a cochlear implant is put in and you still don't get a, a, a response, then it means that the neural fib uh, fibers inside are very unreliable, they are distributed in the periphery and are not yet distributed. A situation like that, an API is very bad. In fact, now more and more people uh, are now of the opinion that you have large series and there's a result. You will see that the incomplete partition type one results are not very good at all. I have one or two patients from the well, but generally, if type incomplete partition type one results are not so also in common. Now, with more and more data coming out from auditory brain cinema, it seems that the outcomes in ABI will probably be better in these patients. But it's still a matter of controversy, so I don't want you to jump and they all in complete partition The other uh, situation is an unbranched cochlear vestibular nerve. That's a challenge. Now, if there is a doubt, uh, CI can be used first, and if there's no response, then it's so, uh, And then what about hypoplastic cochlear nerve? Now, what do you call an hypoplastic cochlear nerve? A nerve, generally a cochlear nerve, is as thick or even thicker than the patient. So that's how we compare it. So if you're looking at a cross-sectional anatomy, the, uh, uh, the finger point and angle, you will see four nerves. Of these, the cochlear and the facial nerves, the two anterior nerves, are more or less the same size. And in, in, in fact, most of the people, the cochlear nerve will be a little thicker than the other patient. But if the cochlear nerve is smaller than the facial nerve, then you start thinking about a hypoplastic cochlear. If it is less than 50% of the diameter of the facial nerve, then that cochlear nerve is defined as a hypoplastic cochlear. So I'll repeat again the cochlear, and uh, cochlear nerve and the facial nerve are more or less the same diameter. In fact, cochlear nerve is a little thicker than the facial nerve. But if the diameter of the cochlear nerve is 50% or less, than the facial nerve, then that is defined as a hypoplastic cochlear nerve. Such a nerve may or may not function, we don't know, because we don't know how many fibers are there which are actually functioning. So, how do you determine whether this is functioning? And that's where a trans tympanic EAPR comes in. If you have a patient with a hypoplastic cochlear nerve, the present protocol is that we would do a trans tympanic EAPR or electrically home where you put an electrode on the promontory, stimulate the promontory, and look for a auditory brain surface. 
if you have a response, it means that this uh, neuronal cytoplasmic is too common, and this patient will receive a function. If you know you have done a transtympanic EAPR and it is negative, you still cannot say that this patient's nerve is not functioning. Maybe the, the technique you use is wrong. Maybe you are not sensitive enough. So even in that situation, we would still counsel the patient to go for a cochlear implant, but with a clear understanding that the cochlear implant may fail. And you may then have to switch over to a brain So this is the current situation. We still don't have enough data on these patients to form definitive indications. So what about the acquired indications? We already talked about some of them. We talked about vestibular schonoma. We talked about the advanced for advanced as well. So these are the uh, current indications. What about the preoperative workup? It's more or less the same as in the popular implant. Only difference is in the imaging. You, know, you want to have a full imaging of the entire brain and focus also on the brain stem area. So you want to know the anatomy that you are going to be. And the approaches could be either a, a retro sigmoid, which is what we do generally for pediatric ABS, or a trans lab, which is generally uh, done more for uh, So it's up to you. Well, basically, a surgeon can decide. We emphasize for a, a trans lab approach. But for pediatric APIs, the retrosigmoid approach is So, what are the anatomical landmarks? So once you open the segment of an angle, you have the main landmark that you need for the choroid plexus. The choroid plexus gives you the Marking for the entrance of the lateral vein. And uh, there's a stuff kemia which traverses the roof of the lateral plexus. The flocculus, so the, the choroid plexus is in many ways the hero. You know, it tells you where the radiation is. The villain, of course, is the flocculus because the flocculus is the part of the cerebral level, which is completely covering this entire region. And if the flocculus is very big, then the whole area is covered and you have to do a lot of dissection. So, flocculus is what covers the and hides the view of the lateral plexus. And if you have the nerve entry zones of the seventh nerve and the ninth nerve, then you can work out the eighth nerve for, for the potential area of the eighth nerve, or what we call the putative entry zone. Seventh, eighth, and ninth form a triangle. And seventh and ninth, if you can work out, then Eighth nerve put it in one can be worked out from the positions of the seven. So, this is how we identify the lateral plexus. There is also a straight vein, and this straight vein will invariably uh, it's quite constant, it doesn't have a name, but it will lead you into the lateral plexus and it will uh, very often take you straight to the operating. Another uh, trick that we all do is on the table. We ask the anesthetist to do a valsalva. And uh, when the valsalva is being done with anesthetist, you will see CSF escaping the lateral plexus. And that will give you again a pointer to the potential site of the lateral plexus. You can identify the lateral plexus. So, this is a, the topographic anatomy of the field. You can see the flocculus is hiding the lateral plexus. Choroid plexus, which is there, will be covering the root entry zone. Is one of the other places, so the Pramabushka, and the straight vein will take you straight into the uh, So these are the landmarks that we go by. And this is an intraoperative picture showing you the uh, and the electrode getting into the lateral That's a broad axis. Again, you see a, a facial nerve here with the hypoplastic risk of the Now, this is a, a, a surgical clip just to show you the position. That's the incision that we use here. Started with, with the plasius incision, but now this is the standard in our, our group. So, we do a, a retro sigmoid trainer. That's where the, the, the sigmoid sinuses, the sinuses here. So, we are going below the transusinus and then you can uh, open the pura, allow the CSO to go out. The moment the CSF rushes out, then the entire cerebellum retracts very nicely. 
That's the point basically here. You see here, green color, but we are now setting on the fire arc now. Very gently to show the, the main uh, seventh and uh, ninth. Uh, so we are now in the ninth and tenth here. So we are identifying the cradle nerves. The ninth nerve is often the guide to the lateral vessel. So you follow the ninth nerve and it will take you to the lateral vessel. The electrode is kept in that area and very gently the pressure is applied over it till the point of pulsing system. So the electrode will be gently pushed in. And uh, it's blind as you can see, you uh, can't see the dynamic. The uh, active sensation becomes very important. And uh, you push it in as much as you can. So you cover the dorsal nucleus well. And uh, also, you know, it should slide in very comfortably. Once you feel the resistance is comfortable, and then you have to stabilize the electrode. Because don't forget, the brain. Apart from the heart, is only other organ which is always pulsating. And tends to put everything out. Whatever you keep inside it will come out eventually. So to avoid this, we usually keep a bit of soft tissue, plug it. And this uh, plug will, for most of time, under the pliosis, and then fix the electrode in. So this is the uh, trick to stabilize the. So once this is done, of course, then a series of Tests are done in trauma. This is very important. And in fact, uh, this is one of the most challenging aspects of the surgery. We test, basically, we monitor a whole lot of nerves. We monitor the fifth nerve, we monitor the seventh nerve, and the lower cranial nerves. But apart from that, you have to do an intraoperative EAPR or electrically remote voluntary medicine. What does it mean? You stimulate the uh, point uh, where the electrode is, with one electrode, and you try and record the rates of responses. This is to ensure that you are in the correct place, that you are actually stimulating the cochlear nucleus. Because don't forget, that's a very important neighborhood. It's a VIP neighborhood. There are a lot of important structures nearby, and you could be stimulating the wrong person or the wrong area. So you don't want to be stimulating the wrong area. So you have to be clear that your electrode is placed on the auditory area that is the cochlear nucleus. So therefore, you have to elicit auditory responses by stimulating the nerve. And this is known as an intraoperative EAP. In uh, general, you will have three waves, suppose five waves you get to the regular brain stem response. Here you get three from the third, fourth, and the fifth. So you correspond to the third, fourth, fifth of the uh, regular ABR. Now the third is from the cochlear nucleus, the fourth is from the olive nucleus, and the fifth is from the nucleus. So in practice, you may get anything from one to three. They're termed as P1 to P. And uh, this is exactly how it looks in an ABR. You see the response. Is a good response. So you have, you have got all the P1, P2, P3. Uh, this shear point is the response. So it means that you are in the wrong place. So the, the audiologist is a very important part of the team, and on the table, he will be telling the surgeon, Look, now you are in the right position, or can you go in a bit more? Can you go cover a bit more of the loss? Can you put it out a bit more? Can you reposition it? So all this he tells us on the table based on the responses that he is getting. And also, you have to get an amplitude. That is, as you keep increasing the strength of the stimulus, the wave morphology must become better, and the latency must become less. So this tells you that you are getting an actual response. So this is also another important you look at. So this is generally the latency that we get in P1, P2, and P3. And what is interesting is, we have looked at several studies the important studies is from our center where we have been able to correlate the, the EABR, which was the pain on the depth uh, patient, the subsequent outcome to the patient. And you see that there's a fairly good correlation. When you have got a good EABR, this patient will do very well in regards of the 
as compared to the other patient who has not had a good EMG because that tells you that location of the electrode is very important and that you have to be in the right spot. Most operatively, we do the switch on usually about uh, six to eight weeks. We take a cochlear implant where uh, you, you switch on very soon, maybe in you know, two weeks or three weeks' time. But there are some centers which even switch on the you know, very next day. But uh, in a brain stem implant, we allow for six to eight weeks for things to heal up and then only do the switch on. And switch on is not a joke. You have to be very, very undertaken a cochlear implant. Here, you are in a very important neighborhood. You can even produce a cardiac arrest. So, you have to be very, very clear that this is done in a, a critical care unit with full support or in a ICU setup or in an operation data center where you have an anesthetist standby or a critical care unit standby with full support for the patient. And there may be some non auditory stimulation, and you have to look for that. But this could be in the, you know, in the bobbing of the visual fields. Feeling a vertigo, tingling, jittering uh, of the visual cues, all kinds of things may be a patient who already played the medicine where they're able to communicate. Uh, children, what's more difficult, we are looking for all these telltale signs when you're doing a surgery. And uh, post operatively, of course, we verify the position uh, by an x ray or better even by a CD scan. That's just before you the electrode the visual CD scan. Does it work? Well, yes, this is Dustin. Dustin is one of our very good performers. And this is done for two years after his uh, activation. You can see that his talk is pretty good. It's almost like a vocal What's important is the is the prosody, you know, ah, 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 that prosody, the, the, the rhythm of the That tells you that's the only way you know that he's listening to himself, you know, because of the prosody. You know, in, in a patient who has not received an implant, either a patient implant or a cochlear implant, and you are just teaching them, uh, you know, communication, over communication, without any auditory input, they lack prosody. They don't have this with It's very flat. But in these children who have had a cochlear implant, what gives them the natural uh, quality to their speech is the prosody, is the rhythm of speech that they have. And that happens when they have their own feedback, they are able to listen to themselves. In talking, then only the rhythm will come. So that's one of the best indications that you can have that these people are actually hearing their own voices. So we have so far had about 56 uh, pediatric pets, one of the largest in the world. And we have uh, 54 children who had get two revisions one due to a device failure, one due to a biofilm which had to be explanted and then re implanted. In all these patients, the indication was bilateral cochlear aplasia and or cochlear Now, let's looking at the outcomes in the first 34 uh, patients who are long enough. There, there's, after six months, there is a benefit, but the benefit is far more when you follow them up long. Run. So, in general, an ABI patient takes much longer than a cochlear implant patient to achieve uh, the the best result. After implanting, even after a year, you see substantial improvement in the condition. And in ABI, it's more like two to three years. So the, the time scale is different. You have to give them much more time. And habilitation for this reason has to go well beyond one year. Most of our brain stem implantees, we give them habilitation at least for two years, and most of them will go for three years. So this is just to show you the, the cap and search course. And compared to the baseline, it was in 12 months they showed. In 10 children, we looked at long term benefit after two years. And uh, with a whole lot of this uh, approaches, this were done on those. And uh, you could see that almost all of them at the end of two years had excellent outcomes, uh, very meaningful. Uh, this is a, a general regression curve for a child with normal hearing, a cochlear implant. You can see that three of the ABI children in this time were even better than cochlear implant. They were actually within the normal hearing and the cochlear implant. But another three were below that and they were about average. Another two or three were well below their normal hearing. So it's a, it's a fixed bag of two. So you have a few of them who do very well in about, I would say about uh, 
30, 40 percent of them would do very well. A third of them would do very well. A third of them would be, uh, you know, average. A third of them may not do well. Why they don't do well? Maybe variable factors of the electrode dimensions of the lateral lenses, the, the anatomy of the body is variables. We don't know yet. Now, who uh, not? So, this is the uh, general outcome. But one thing, even if the child is not doing very well, it still aids their literacy. And almost all children who had an ABI will complain if the equipment was faulty. They will all want immediately the, uh, the equipment be placed, which tells you that they're benefiting from it, they're using it. So, even if their uh, hearing is, uh, or, or communication is not very, very good, they would still use it because it will help them for the So you see that almost all of them have used oral and sign language together, which is what most of us do. You know, when, when you're talking, most of us use oral and sign language. But these children are dependent quite a bit on the oral and sign language. Helps ABI is that uh, assistive device for recognition. So the other uh, interesting uh, evidence that we have that the ABI is actually giving them good hearing is particle potentials are, are interesting biomarkers where you record the potentials from the auditory cortex in response to sound. And uh, it has been done, extensive work has been done in uh, Hawking mm -hmm. class. Basically, this is a very important thing because when you have a, a child who is deaf, you have done a cochlear implant and you switch on, you will not get a, a particle potential. But as the auditory experience increases, in three months, you will start seeing particle auditory potentials. The morphology of these potentials, CAEPs, will keep improving over six months, one year. So basically, what does it tell you? It, the particle auditory work potential is not just a test of hearing, but a test of auditory cortical maturation. It's a biomarker for the auditory cortex maturation. It tells you not only is this person hearing, but the hearing listening experience is improving in this person. That's a very important information. So in corporate implants, we depend on this quite a bit to know that these people are benefiting from the corporate implant over a period of time. Now, similarly, in auditory brainstem implant, our group was the first, of course, you know, in the whole world to show that you can also get cortical uh, potentials in ABIs. So that's a very important and concrete evidence that not only are they hearing with the ABI, but they actually are using it for listening and improving their auditory experience in their auditory process. So this has been a very uh, uh, substantial support in favor of the auditory maturity that we have seen in these children who have received ABI similar to the function. And you can see also an amplitude growth in this uh, uh, in this year. So very uh, strong evidence that this is a uh, basically uh, ABI children are hearing uh, benefiting Now coming to the cerebellar flocculus. I told you this is a villain. This is a flocculus is what hides the operative field of the lateral vessels from the the surgeon. And uh, we evaluated the difficulty that we faced in this patient, looking at the size of the flocculus. And we divided, our group divided the uh, size of the populace into four groups. Grade one, two, three, and four. Where grade one, where the populace was very, very stress, not seen at all. Grade two, where it is hyperplastic. Grade three, it's uh, small, but it's more central. And uh, there's a small choroid plexus. In general, wherever the uh, flocculus is small, the choroid plexus will be big. There's an inverse relationship between. At four, you have a large flocculus which is hiding the entire area, the, the paramilushka, but the correct plexus is very small. The first so just to show you this great part where you have a, a absent flocculus, you have a big correct plexus. Grade two, that's the correct plexus, small flocculus. Grade three, you have a small flocculus, but it is more, more central. And in four, you have a huge uh, flocculus and you can hardly see it. In general, two thirds of the patients will be either grade one and two, which is good because you know, your job is easier. But 
one third of them would be grade three and four, and there you have to do more resections. So difficulty entry was noted in grade three and four modules, and there was also a lot of addition for the battery pieces. So we had to do a lot more resection. And more interaction of the cerebellum is required to visualize the parameter uh, motion. Always the ninth nerve was the best guide to the parameters. Grade one and two flocculus, on the hand, it was very much easier to enter. And uh, but in general, does it mean that if you have a one and two and you have an easy entry, you have better outcomes? No. The outcomes don't match with this uh, size of the flocculus. What it tells you is the difficulty that you are going to be facing as a surgeon for this. So, uh, next comes the vestibular dysfunction. We started noticing that a small group of patients would develop vestibular This could be anything from unsteadiness in the postoperative period to frank nystagmus. But fortunately, all of them are transient. They will all be there for a few days, and four or five days, they all disappear. So, we then looked at the group of patients, 25 patients, how many of them had? Four of them. So one sixth of them had vestibular symptoms, and the others had no vestibular symptoms. And of these uh, 16 patients, 12 had unsteadiness, and uh, four was had uh, vertigo and nystagmus. In uh, the patients who had severe vestibular symptoms, we found that cerebral flocculus was either grade three or four. In other words, the more dissection we did of the flocculus, more the chances of them getting a vertigo. So, grade four patients, invariably, a big number of them, three out of five, had severe vestibular In grade three, or 25 percent of them, or one out of four, had vestibular In other words, the more dissection of the flocculus, the larger the flocculus, more the post operative vestibular symptoms. But the only good thing is, it is temporary and they immediately. What about the complications? We had 50 of our patients, but fortunately, no very severe complications. Most of them were non audit distribution, which is a placement of the electron. So, here you have to replace the electron. In two patients, they had CSF leak post operatively, but they repeated conservatively, lumbar drain, so on. So, we don't have to actually open up. The other test which is useful is a, what is known as an NIRS or a near infrared spectroscope, where it is a non it is a, again a non invasive surface measurement uh, where you can uh, look at the in, using infrared spectroscopy, you can look at the blood flow and ask the, uh, the functioning of the auditory cortex in a very non invasive and efficient way of asking the auditory cortex you know, whether it is responding to what it needs to. This is again a useful test which can be done. What about the future? So, I already told you about sleeper ABI in NF2. That is, the, you're doing an NF2, you put the ABI on the first side and then wait for the second side uh, beginning to go down, and then in the second side, you activate the first. This is particularly promoted by the Manchester group, uh, and they have a lot of experience with that. And not everybody agrees with that for reasons I told you already. Have an implant there, it precludes the use of MRI in these patients. And we want to follow up the second side. Um, because indications are still expanding, you know, I told you about the uh, incomplete partition type one, there's still a lot of controversy there. Uh, the uh, efficient cochlear nerves, hyperplastic cochlear nerves, you know, so there's still a lot of gray zones here. What about the brainstem anatomy? And a deformed brain some anatomy, let's say a big tumor, uh, deforming anatomy, does it in some way affect the outcomes? We're still not very sure about it. Uh, we're also looking at minimally invasive surgical techniques. You know, one of the things we have tried is endoscopic AI. Uh, we're still working with it. We are advantage because in children, you don't want to make a big craniotomy. But nowadays, what we do is we do a craniotomy, uh, but then we replace the but even then, if you can avoid making a big opening, nothing like that. What about bilateral ABIs? Yes, I think there's a, there's a lot of thought to be said for that. But it cannot be simultaneous. It has to be sequential. You have to do one side, give enough time for the child to recover, maybe six months to one year later, then go to the other side. 
and you certainly need better speech coding strategies for AI because at the present moment, the speech coding strategies we use in brainstorm implant are all the same as cochlear implant, and we know very well that the, the anatomy of the cochlear implant is completely different from the anatomy of the cochlear. We also know that the, the physiology or the functioning of the cochlear implant also is very different from the cochlear, and the pitch distribution in the cochlear implant is very different. From for example, in the cochlea, the pitch distribution is mainly two-dimensional. Two, two it's like a, a piano. But in the brain stem, it is three-dimensional. So it's not only on the surface, but it also goes into the depth of the brain stem. So the way the, the uh, speech is analyzed in the brain stem is very different from the way it is in the cochlea. So we have to develop better for the, uh, for the brain stem. And I think this is part of the reason why you're not getting the best possible results. This is just to show you the endoscope assisted ABI. So, what does the future hold for our patient implant? I think we have to have better uh, imaging of the cochlear nucleus. Can we image the cochlear nucleus? Theoretically, it's possible because the cochlear nucleus straddles the inferior cerebellar productive. Dorsal to the inferior cerebellar productive is the dorsal cochlear nucleus. Ventral to the cochlear, intracellular productive is ventral cochlear. In the MRI, you can have differential uh, you know, imaging for this structure. So, you can actually, if you have sufficiently good definition, to study the uh, cochlear nucleus, especially uh, the mass of the cochlear nucleus, much better. This is, I think, something in the future. As also, it advances in designing uh, of the uh, implant. And taking into consideration the variation of the anatomy of the pediatric and other brains. And uh, we also need electrodes which are close approximate to the little targets uh, to understand, get the best out of them. And as I said, we need better processing strategies and uh, better out tools for assessing. I already told you about particle work potentials, about uh, the NIRS. Also, O2PET is a potential tool. For uh, studying the particles uh, and what is being done. One of the areas which is developing now is an area called optogenetics, where a virus uh, delivers a gene to the neurons and uh, the, the, the neurons produce a light sensitive protein called opsins. So, if you shine a light on the neuron, the neuron gets stimulated. It's sort of electrical stimulation, you're using light as a so this could be much better than using an electrical stimulus because, as you know, that light is uh, much quicker than the electrical stimulus, and it can be focused to produce much more independent channels. Uh, it's just to show the same thing. Now we also have a few patients, uh, particularly in Hanover, Germany, where they have done a midbrain implant. So these are patients who have completely deformed uh, brain stem in a few patients. The uh, tumors are so big that the entire brain stem was deep. So they could not put the, the implants in the brain stem. So they went higher up and then they put it up in the inferior particular. Uh, the, they have an auditory perception, uh, seven of them now. Uh, they have auditory perception, but it's not, uh, you know, great. They are not doing very well. They have some sense of perception of our hearing. But I think we need, again, you know, more work done on that. Uh, still early days. Uh, what about cortical implants? Will it happen in the future? I'm sure it will happen sometime, provided we uh, understand the uh, auditory cortex much better. And we still have to work out the auditory cortex. They're still struggling on the surface. We need much more information. What are the lessons we have learned? What are the carry home messages? ABA surgery is still evolving. It's difficult, but it's safe in experienced hands. And I think it's, it's worth the effort. And early intervention is very important. This is important. Take advantage of the process. The younger the child, the better it is. We know that central auditory organization takes place with the ABI because of the evidence you had from particle work potentials. And particle work potentials are useful to, in addition to EABI, assess the ABI outcomes. A good biomarker to assess for the optical maturation, phonemic awareness, auditory discrimination, and speech understanding. 
We also have put forth a simple classification, which is now accepted for the grading of the populace. It will help a surgeon to predict the difficulty in insertion of the. Uh, we are working still on it, we need more data. A large prominent populace with the need for more surgical intervention and a greater chance of post operative investing in these areas. Thank you very much. That's what I want to share with you. We're more than happy to uh, answer your questions. Yeah. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, the talk was excellent as always. Uh, thank you very, very much, sir, for uh, giving your time on this Sunday uh, to educate uh, on ABI. So we, can we take questions, sir? Yes, of course. Yes. Yeah. Uh, there are a few questions from uh, a few people here. I'll read out one by one. Uh, a question from Dr. Maunika. Is there any role of functional MRI in the preoperative evaluation of auditory neuropathy or in case of cochlear hypoplasia? Very good question, in fact. See, the, the problem is that you are dealing with a child with a profound hearing loss when you have a cochlear hypoplasia. Yes. So in a child who's got a profound hearing loss, a functional MRI will not be helpful. Yes. A functional MRI is only helpful to the child is hearing. In audit neuropathy, again, you know, it's unreliable. Some people have done it. Have done it uh, in some in this shown results, in some it has not shown results. It's unpredictable. So that's the whole problem in functional MRI. A much simpler and more reliable strategy is to use a task mechanic. That's why we use it. It's also, it's also more cost effective. But functional MRI will have some role certainly in, uh, you know, in the uh, preoperative workup of body neuropathy. Yes, sir. not a hyperplastic now with Okay. So the next question, can you take them? Yeah. Uh, a question from Dr. Vinod Felix. In some patients, we opt for ABI in case the CI fails. So to reduce the financial problems, is there any electrode that can be used both as a CI electrode and an ABI electrode plate? Again, a very good question. Unfortunately, we don't. See, the entire shape of the electrode is different and you can't reuse the same electrode. So what we have now worked out in these patients is that we work out a common package for CI plus ABI, where of course the speech coding, you know, the, the speech processor is the same. So they don't have to pay for that. They're only paying for the electrode. So we have to work out with the company. So we have actually worked out with companies now so that they will offer a package to these patients. They will usually give them a hospital plan, and if uh, it's not functional, they will use ABI and then try and you know, combine the two into one single plan. But the same electrode can't be used. Okay, sir. The next question comes from Lal Serleka. Uh, she wants to know uh, how would be the ground electrode in an ABI? In a, uh, uh, so again, a good question. The, actually, the ABI is just like a cochlear implant, but it's built into the housing itself. Yeah. So there's no separate ground electrode you know, that you have to use. It's built into the entire housing. Uh, and it's the same as the popular plant. Okay. The next question uh, comes from Dr. Sheetal Shah. Does an ABI work for auditory neuropathy and central auditory processing disorder? Audit neuropathy, I already told you, you know, in a, in a very rare situation of a central uh, or, a, or a proximal audit neuropathy, it may have a role, but you know, the evidence is not very much in favor of it now. As of now, uh, if you ask me, will I do it? I would have a lot of reservations. CAPD, no, no. It's a different, completely different bag of goods. So, you know, CAPD and ABI has no role. You know, you know it's a processing disorder and you have to work on that. And it's a very complex problem. So, ABI has no role in a CAPD. It's central types or proximal types of central audit neuropathy may have a role. Again, very controversial. Yes, sir. So, uh, CAPD is uh, a relative contraindication for ABI, you mean to say? Yes, that is it. Yes. Now, next question comes from Dr. Amit. Uh, he wants to know why is the switch on delayed for six to eight weeks post-op ABI? Yeah. Because, you know, you in, in the, the healing process in the brainstem is very complex. It's much more time than in a popular plant. 
So you want to give time for the entire gliosis to set in, electrodes to stabilize, and all that takes time. So we give a good six to eight weeks, and then we'll do the suture. Because the heating process is much slower. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Dr. Vivek. He wants to know how would a displaced AVI electrode plate be managed post-operatively? Displaced electrode, yes, it can be managed because you will know that it is not in the right place. And this is why intraoperative electrophysiology becomes very important. So, you know, the audiologist will tell you that you are not in the right position. So then we reinsert till we get the right position. So we actually, this is why time, it takes more time. In fact, uh, you know, if you look at an AVI surgery, at least 50% of the time is spent on electrophysiology. Very, very important. Now, many people think that, okay, you know, we put electrodes down. No, in fact, the, the bigger work is the electrophysiology. And uh, the, you need to get it right. Thank you on the table. Okay, sir. So, the next question is from Dr. Billy. Uh, are there any different audiological test batteries uh, different from CI per ABI? The operative workup is exactly the same. The only okay. difference is the imaging. You know, in the imaging, you have to actually have a lot more information for the brain stem. So we uh, put a lot of emphasis on the uh, MRI of the brain. And we said we need a three test by MRI. Yes. We have the anatomy well defined for the size of the formulas, the anatomy of the uh, atomicities and so on. So the next question is from Dr. Ravi Shankar. If there are any complicate, what are sorry, what are the complications that can be expected when you have to go for a revision ABI, and how do you manage? Good question. Uh, again, the revision ABI is a big challenge. You know, not, not many people in the world have done it. Uh, we have had two cases where we had to do revisions. Uh, the uh, problem is we can expect is the bias. Gliosis or the scarring which you see in the atrophysis. So the surgeon has to, you know, have a lot of experience in expertise, taking out this and putting back a new implant without trauma. The other option, of course, is that you leave the electrode in place, you remove the uh, the uh, stimulator, but keep the electrode in place as you do in cochlear implants. And when you're doing a revision, you do the second set. That's the other option. You're not very experience with revision surgery, then that's experience. That's what you should do. Okay. So the next question, uh, we don't know the name of the speaker, uh, sorry, participant here. He wants to know, uh, what is the minimum FDA approved age to consider ABI? Oh, that's a question. FDA is not approved age yet. In fact, this is the process actually of FDA approval. It's quite advanced. I think they'll probably get the approval in another few months. Uh, Interestingly, the data for FDA approval has actually come from India. It's actually, we have given them the data for that. We have the, one of the largest CDs now. And uh, it is CE approved now. And FDA is in the process of approval, but it's quite advanced now. So I think in the next two or three months, the age that we have recommended minimum is two years. Okay. So the next question is from Dr. Mohan. Uh, he wants to know whether there are any chances of ABI rejection. Oh, yeah, there's yeah. anything else. But the bigger problem that rejection is biofilm is just in the CI. So, in fact, the two patients we had revision, one had a trauma, you know, children fall, hit their head, yes. one had a trauma, and uh, the device failed. So, it was a heart failure. So, we had to actually revise the device. The second uh, possibility is when you have uh, biofilm. Uh, biofilm, you know, means you take it out. And allow it to cool, heal up, and then you have to go back and leave. So that's a bigger problem than simple diffusion. Yeah. The next question is from Dr. Musba. He wants to know why is speech perception better in CI than in ABI? Absolutely. Now, the reason is very simple. You know, the, the strategies, both speech coding strategies, are all designed for the, uh, the topography of the cochlea. So how the, the, the chronotopicity is distributed in the cochlea is two-dimensional. We have much better understanding of the, the play-speech principle in the cochlea than the brain scan. 
So our strategies in the speech coding strategies in the brains are not adequate. They still evolve. This is why some children do very well, some children don't. So our understanding of the chronotopicity uh, in the brains is still lacking. That's the reason. Okay, sir. Uh, again, the same uh, uh, participant want to know. What is the difference between a CI electrode and an ABI electrode plate? Well, it's the same electrode, but the way it is distributed is different. In a, in a CI, you know, you have 12 pairs or 21 electrodes, whichever place in the company, in a, in a linear fashion. But in the ABI, it is all distributed as a flatly on a plate. And then you put it, uh, it's just the, the, the same electrodes, but how they are distributed or laid out. Okay, uh, a question from Dr. Amir. Uh, what are the percent? What is the percentage of meningitis after a ABI? Uh, meningitis is not a problem. Meningitis. Not worried about meningitis. Yes, sir. Uh, I think they have not had any meningitis. Okay, sir. a question from Dr. Sethu. Uh, the youngest and the oldest age of ABI in your experience, sir? Well, the oldest. NF2 patients, you can do at any age. You know? So if you are doing NF2 in an elderly patient, let's say you know, you're operating him at uh, 30 or 40, that's about the, generally the age that you operate this patient. You can still do it, you know, in this patient. The youngest we have done, uh, pediatric ABI, was a little over one year old. Uh, it's about 14 months. Okay. So uh, we have finished up the questions from the participants. Uh, uh, can I ask a few questions, sir? Yes, please. <laughs> yes, sir. So my question is regarding the demyelinating disorders of the eighth nerve. Suppose there is a demyelinating disorders of the eighth nerve. Uh, to decide on the side of the ABI, uh, is there any investigations to prefer a cochlear nucleus on one side? Yeah, the, the investigation that you should depend on is a transdependent gene. Okay. You now, if you have a transdependent EAPR and you get better responses on one side, assuming the, the extent of deafness or uh, hearing loss is the same on both sides, then the side with the better transdependent EAPR response would be the better side for intervention. Okay. Uh, sir, in which uh, uh, condition would you opt for a subtonsillar approach for ABI? Well, it's a very good question, you know, Kiran, but sir. so far, you know, it is only in theory. You know, we haven't done it, but it's actually an excellent approach. Uh, Subconscious approach would be very good because you could actually do both sides to that approach. That's the advantage of that approach. You know, so you could actually go and you know even do both sides at the same time if you want. So that's a very good approach, which most neurosurgeons would be very very happy with, because it's a route that they take normally a lot of them. But uh, we haven't done that. Nobody has done that. Now, simply because we don't have electrodes which are long enough for that. Okay. Sir, would you recommend uh, usage of a 30 degree endoscope to visualize the uh, area of. We have done that actually. We have actually not 30 degree, we have used a uh, 70 degree endoscope. That's more appropriate uh, to actually look at the area uh, to see electrode insertion. It's not, it's not very easy. It looks good on principle, but in practice, it doesn't really. Oh, but because you know, a lot of them are collapsed and you have to actually dissect them all. And it was, uh, more or less a blind procedure. Okay. One last question, sir. Regarding the receiver stimulator of ABI, so do we go for a non uh, ferromagnetic uh, hardware or do you offer a removable magnet? In, why? Because the ABI patient may offer repeated MRIs to see whether there is any VS once again. Recurring. No, no, you, you, you don't have uh, removable magnets, the same, exactly same as in a cochlear implant, which yes. is why we always do the uh, second side and then do the implant display. The problem is that uh, even after that, you may still like to follow up the patient for any residual you know, tumors or if it's not a complete removal. You are dependent on CT scans, not on MRI. So it's not ideal, but that's really what we Sir, now the ABI electrodes, are they made up of only platinum or platinum iridium, sir? Yes, it's platinum. Most of them are, most electrodes, the companies are now making only platinum. Okay, sir. So, the electrodes are placed on the Dacron mesh. 
so that will uh, cause fibrosis and there will be a capsule formation that may be adhered to the target site in a revision case when you remove is there a chance of injuring the target site yeah, very again an excellent question see the principle is the dacron mesh will cause gliosis and the gliosis will fix the lesion in actual practice if you look at most surgeries we actually cut off the dacron mesh yes and then we introduce it because the dacron mesh can be quite a nuisance in interfering with the insertion process it cannot allow you to go the full length so most surgeons i know uh, including us our team we just cut off the dacron mesh and then insert it and then uh, you know allow it to stay in So the insertion becomes far better if you uh, so it will form some amount of gliosis and in removing it it will cause some trauma but lateral resistance is not very uh, you know, neurologically sensitive so it won't cause too much of damage you have to be gentle so we have finished all the questions uh, i would like to take the opportunity to thank you very very much sir for giving a wonderful talk thanks to sahasra ent foundation for organizing this webinar and thanks to all the participants here who have been with us here uh, who have been our strength in conducting that kind of a uh, webinar thank you very very much sri harsh thank, thank you so much for the opportunity and uh, special thanks to sri harsh for organizing this It's very nice of him and i think i, I enjoyed this thank you very much, thank you very much sir. Thank, thank you. you very much sir uh, for giving us your valuable time on this thank week you, sir. thank you very much all the best come to the good work thank, thank you. you sir thank you very much sir with this we end the webinar sir uh, have thank a good you. day